today's uh, session, and probably I think we don't have, we will not have time to go through the entire story. So maybe we will need the second one. Um, is uh, to try to explain sort of uh, how you prove conformal, I mean, how Stasmanov's proof conformal invariance of the Ising model uh, in two dimension on the lattice, on the squared lattice. So, um, so one is looking at the Ising model on z squared, uh, or more precisely, uh, on a, in a domain which is contained in z squared. And uh, the goal is to prove basically that uh, something similar to uh, Smyrna, I mean, to Cardi's formula for, for easing. So, and the idea of the proof uh, has similarity with that of, of uh, uh, Cardi's formula for, for percolation. Uh, so if you want to look at the paper somehow, curiously, the paper is on, on archive since nine or ten months, but uh, he managed to make it in such a way that uh, not people are not all aware of the fact that it's on archive. So because it, he didn't put it on the probability archive, but it's on the MathPhys uh, archive in some, I don't know, I think July or August. 2007. So when I think if you Google it in the title, there must be something like holomorphic fermion, uh, something like that. So if you type this, Smirnov holomorphic fermions uh, archive, you will get to find the paper. And, and it's very well written. So uh, uh, you know that there are. It's, it's a good lesson for uh, many of us because he, uh, he could prove conforming of invariance of easing seemingly, you know, at least one year before he, the, the paper came out. And so there was this rumor that he knew how to prove. He gave talks about it, and people did not really un all understand what was going on in the talks. But, uh, you know, he was not satisfied with the cleaning out of, of the proof. He just the paper, he just wanted to make the paper public only when he, it was really presentable and readable for a wide audience and uh, to have it el as elegant as possible. So it is a, you know, it, it was already like that for the uh, Cardi proof in a way, because in the end, you know, when you read this paper, it's five pages and it's all there and very clean. And there again, it's, okay, it's more complicated because there are more involved arguments, but uh, it's, it's all there. So. And actually, if you look at the paper and you read it carefully, you see that his paper is called number one. Actually, the Cardi formula paper is also number one. And there's the number two always uh, okay. uh, and waiting. But he basically promised two others in the series. And also, it's, it's, uh, there's a big difference with the paper with, uh, on percolation because uh, you know, percolation, the trick was specific to percolation. And people tried to extend, you know, adapt the proof of Cardi's formula uh, to other lattices, to other models. And it's really specific to, to this model and to this lattice. Here, the ideas that he proposes here are, uh, have potential uh, to prove things for other models, to prove things for uh, other lattices and to prove also things about near critical problems. So not only at criticality, but so in a way it's more uh, uh, general, or if you want that, or uh, opens more door than, than the proof of Cardi's formulas and it's really worth looking at it because maybe one has ideas to what one can do. So, um, so I don't want to go too fast. So I, I, I think uh, uh, so you should really stop me if, if you have the impression that uh, I should uh, clarify some things. And uh, and the other thing is I don't know exactly uh, what I shall remind about uh, easing and random cluster models before starting. 
Does everybody know what a random cluster model is? Oh, and the relation? I shall record. So remember that the easing model, so by the way, if you want uh, references for this, I guess most of you have got my French lecture notes from, and so there's the first part on percolation, the second part on easing and random cluster models, and the beginning of the second part basically is all what you need to know about uh, these random cluster models. And, but there are, of course, there's a book by Grimmett which is called The Random Cluster Model, there's a, which is, a, if you know the percolation book, you know that Grimmett's books are uh, nice to read. And, uh, but what, what we need here basically, so basic, let, let's just say the easing model and more general the, uh, the POTS model. So it's, if you have a G, a finite graph, and beta uh, positive number, uh, a configuration sigma, so that's what you choose at random, is a coloring of the sites of the graph, right? So it's a, from the set of sites, it's a map from the set of sites into minus one, plus one, or sometimes you call it zero, one, sometimes you call it one, two, but anyway, it's a two, a set consistent of two elements. So basically at each site, sigma, chooses uh, each side of the lattice, the sigma chooses a spin, plus one or minus one, or a color, if it's one or two, or whatever. And you do it with a probability, which is, um, okay, you have a normalization factor that depends on beta, and you do it with a probability which is, penalizes the number of uh, neighbors that disagree. So you do something like beta times some over all pairs of points that are neighbors, the indicator function of sigma x is not equal to sigma y. Okay? So you penalize neighbors when they don't disagree. So it's not like percolation where neighbors don't care about each other and have a given probability p or 1 minus p to be 1 or 2. Um, here you just, you have an interaction between the, the, the different uh, neighbors. And of course, this definition, as opposed to percolation, there's a big issue about defining this measure, what it means when the graph is infinite. Because in percolation, you have IID things, so you can define it on the finite set, you can define it on an infinite set. Here, when the graph is infinite, uh, the normalization constant here is obviously going to blow up, going to infinity, or something, something is going wrong here. And therefore, uh, you have to decide what sort of limit you take in order to, to prove or to decide that, uh, define the, the thing in, in infinite volume on an infinite graph. And there are problems. I mean, there are things you cannot prove about, uh, about uh, there are questions you, you don't know the answer of uh, about these uh, models. Okay, but roughly speaking, uh, okay, maybe I should not uh, say too much. But roughly speaking, there is a phase transition. Uh, and here one has to be careful because the phase transition means when the graph goes to infinity, when the graph becomes infinitely large, uh, what happens? And there are different ways to, 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 to see it. But basically, roughly speaking, the idea is the following. If a graph is very large, then if you don't penalize uh, disagreeing neighbors enough, uh, then what is going to happen is that large, you know, things that are distance far apart will decorrelate very fast. So the, you don't penalize enough the fact that people disagree locally, then you will have completely disorder, right? And, 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 and even though there is a correlation between what happens here and there, it will decorrelate exponentially fast with the distance between the points. And if you penalize, so if beta is large enough, then you penalize a lot uh, configuration where the neighbors uh, disagree. And what is going to happen is that basically one opinion, I mean, one spin will basically invade almost everything, a little bit like in supercritical percolation. One spin will have a majority, uh, and you will have some pockets of resistance of the, others, of the other spin. But so there will be not, it will not be an equilibrium uh, between plus and minus on large scale, but one opinion will win. And this is, of course, motivated by all sorts of uh, things from uh, ferromagnetism or 
other models that's where it come from so in a way this is probably the oldest model of uh, statistical physics before percolation and because people were trying to understand you know why can it be that iron you know uh, stays has a magnetization and when you heat it up then the magnetiz at a certain temperature the magnetization disappears and this has to do with the fact that basically with the precisely in this toy model or model that the, the when beta you know changes uh, at first there is a majority rule and then when beta becomes smaller then suddenly there is a the, the plus and minus become equal and uh, these things okay so that's the easing model and it turns out that in z squared the special role is played and we, we will see that in a moment a special value call it beta v uh, there is that one can identify as being probably the the critical one, the one that separates these two phases, uh, and I'll tell you in a moment why. And and okay, we I say that uh, in a moment what what it means. But it's a little bit like if you remember percolation. You, are, you, you saw percolation in, in, on the triangular lattice. And you recognized quite quickly that P equals 1 half is special, right? That there is a symmetry, some, something asymmetric at 1 half, some duality or self-duality of the model. And it takes some effort, uh, namely Menshikov or, or, I mean, the exponential decay proof that uh, Vlad has showed you to prove that this special value where you have this uh, self-duality property is, in fact, indeed the critical value at which there is a phase transition for the connectivity properties on large scale, right? Because you have to, you have to make sure that uh, certain things uh, don't happen, so that uh, either one wins or the other one wins or things like that. So that the two, can, okay. So. Uh, so here, it's a little bit the same in the sense that it's easy to guess, and you'll see in a moment, that there is a special value where you have some self-duality type property. And then it takes more effort to prove that it is actually exactly the critical one. Um, and if you look at the proof of Smirnoff's result uh, on Cardi's, I mean Cardi's formula, you never use that one half is actually PC. You, what you use is the fact that at one half, you have the symmetry, the fact that you can flip you know, black into white and white into black, and you don't care about the fact that once you're slightly larger, then suddenly an infinite cluster appears. So uh, in a way, the important feature is that when you, w we will, I mean, one works with this special value, and you don't have to care about the phase transition and the large-scale properties of these things. So now we can forget about what it means, you know, that what the phase transition is for easing and so on. You just work with the special value at which you have a special property. So a random cluster model. So yeah, maybe just I say uh, one word is there's an another model, other models that are called the POTS models. So am I too, sm too slow now? Because you, you <laughs> I, uh, I know that many of you know this story already. So. Uh, huh? Okay. So a POTS model is basically exactly the same story, except that here, instead of having two options, when you each side, you have Q options. So here you take one, two, all the way to Q. Right? And the definition is exactly the same. So at each side, you, color, you have Q possibilities. And uh, you choose one of these Q colors at random. And again, there will be a critical value and a very special, va I mean, a critical value. And there's also a special value that you guess uh, is also the critical one. OK. Uh, so random cluster model. Uh, so this is a, you see, the, the, this is a model that plays a game on sites. Each side, uh, to each side, you assign a color or a spin. And uh, a random cluster model is a model is a percolation model. A model uh, with some dependency. 
So it's not the usual uh, percolation model on edges. So remember, when you look at percolation on the graph G, on the finite graph, uh, there are two things you can say. You can either toss a coin to decide if a site is open or closed, or you can toss a coin in order to decide if an edge is open or closed and if you're allowed to travel through this edge. Okay, so it's what is called bond percolation if you have percolation on, on the bonds or on the edges and site percolation if you, if you toss a coin on sites. So, and you certainly all know that uh, for usual percolation and Basically, if you look at percolation on sites, then the triangular lattice is nice because PC, PC is one half. But if you look at percolation on edges, then uh, it's a square lattice, which is nice because uh, it has a self-duality property and, uh, and PC is one half for percolation on edges. So we want, in a way, to generalize uh, the Bernoulli usual independent percolation on, on the square lattice Z squared. And so we take a G finite. And you say that omega is a configuration from the set of edges into 0, 1. So 0, 1 being, a, you can decide to call it open, closed, or, or black, white, or vacant, occupied, or whatever, and decide that black means vacant, or black means occupied, and 1, or OK. So, so it takes two values, but this one is not something that you can generalize to more than values. Right? It's either open or closed, and it does it have it's, each edge can have only two states. And you fix Q, and you fix P. So Q here is fixed and plays the role, similar role than the number of colors there, right? And P is the par population parameter that plays somehow a role similar to beta over there. It's the thing you can play with once you have fixed Q. And then the probability uh, PQ of um, this, when the graph is finite, is again something like 1 over a renormalization constant that tilde that times Q to the, OK, let's do it like this, P to the number open, open uh, edges, 1 minus P number of closed edges, So if I would have just this, then this is only Bernoulli percolation. Right? The probability of a given configuration is p to the power number of open things, 1 minus p to the power number of closed things. But here we sort of put a weighting, which is q to the power k of omega. And this is the number of connected components of omega. So basically, you give a bonus to those configurations. OK, suppose Q is larger than 1. You give a bonus to those configurations that have more connected components. And, uh, but, and the constant here is there to take care of the fact that you get a probability measure in the end. And there's no problem with to define these things as long as G is finite. And again, there's an issue about what happens when G is infinite and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and actually, uh, so these model, this model is also called FK model for twin Castellane. And maybe you have noticed in the percolation picture that there's an inequality which is called FKG. And you may wonder why you, given the fact that this equality in, in the case of percolation is rather trivial, why you know you need to say that it's the FKG inequality because it's just a simple correlation equality. Uh, the true story is that basically the, this inequality for percolation was known before, and that what FKG did, Fortune, Castellane, Geneva, was to prove that the FKG inequality still holds for this model when Q is larger than 1. So they proved the inequality for another class of models which is more general than percolation. And usually, the inequality in the case of percolation is referred to Harris inequality, or, but probably it was known before also. So probably you, are, you know, OK, since this is recorded, uh, if, if when one does probability, uh, there, are, there, are, there are two, I mean, 
more, of course, than that. But uh, at least in my personal experience, there are always two names that show up each time you do something complete. It can be anything, you know, in probability, something completely different. And there are two names, you know, that usually you say, well, who's the first guy who proved this nice thing, you know, and then you... Rec so in my experience, basically, either Keston shows up, you know, just uh, he did the self-avoiding walks, he did the uh, random walks on groups, he did the percolation, he did the uh, Levy processes, he did, uh, okay, all sorts of things. Uh, you know, the growth, exponential growth of, of trees, uh, okay, so, so that's one guy. And the other guy is actually Harris, uh, that uh, always showed up, you know, at, at several occasions. Uh, say, who's the first guy who understood this? And, well, okay. Uh, I, actually, I don't know if, if Harris is, uh, he's somewhere um, retired or he died two years ago, okay. So, but he's a, So the, the percolation is, is not FKG inequality, it should be Harris inequality when you use it for percolation. Uh, okay. Um, and probably it's this Harris, because Harris is a famous, I mean, it's a common name. So, Okay, anyway. So you have a random cluster a model, and you have a percolation, easing percolation model, and there's a direct relation between the two. And uh, maybe I should explain this because what I'm going to show you, I mean, there are different versions of a Smirnoff result, but uh, uh, the one I'm going to show you is a result about the random cluster model. And so we'll, if we want to say that it says something about easing, then you have to understand what the relation, that, what the direct relation between the two is. That's why I'm doing this, uh, telling you this story. So the relation is the following, is that if you have G, a finite graph, Um, there's a natural way to couple uh, a configuration of easing with a configuration of the random cluster model for Q equals 2 uh, that goes as follows. So basically, if you start from easing, right, easing configuration sigma, right, and then what you do is that for each uh, edge x, y such that sigma x is equal to sigma y, toss a coin of parameter something, let's say p. I think that's, uh, we have to check, uh, to decide if this edge is open for omega. Okay? So what you decide is you start with easing and you declare an edge can be open only if sigma of x is equal to sigma of y. But it, not, it not, doesn't have to. So what you do is you just look at all the edges that can be open for the given configuration sigma and then you toss an independent coin of a certain parameter to, this, to look at if it's open or not. Okay. So, and what you end up here is the fact that this omega will follow p index p to uh, p2, where P is a well chosen, right? So basically, for each choice of easing with parameter beta, you can associate naturally a random cluster configuration, and you can go backwards. So if I have omega uh, random cluster model configuration, what you can do, you can define sigma by choosing. Uh, spin independently for all uh, 
K of omega clusters. So all sites in the same cluster have the same spin. So it's a simple exercise to check that, okay, this is particularly easy, right? Because if I start with a random cluster model with this configuration, with this thing here, this probability measure here, and then, you know, I see that there are K of omega, cl K of omega uh, clusters, and now I toss a coin for each, uh, uh, to color each cluster in uh, either plus one or minus one, or if it would be, a, uh, if Q would be larger than two, in, uh, you have Q choices for each cluster, right? So what you end up is that here, in this probability measure, the probability that you get a configuration omega and sigma, when you do both, right, is just one over z uh, tilde, p, p to the power open edges for omega, one minus p times closed edges for omega. And then you have q to the power k, and then one over q to the power k, because you give a bonus to omega, which is this, and then the probability to choose exactly this coloring that is given by sigma is going to be one over q to the power k, because you, you toss k times the coin that has a probability one over q to give the result given by sigma. Okay. And, um, and then when you look at the marginal law of sigma with respect to this thing, then you, you see that the, okay, I, I, it's in a simple exercise to check that this will be easing for a certain value of beta. Okay, so, um, so in particular, in, in this bijection, I'm, I'm too quick in a way. I, I feel I'm too quick for those who don't know this and too slow for those who do. But in, in this bijection here, the important thing is, and this is quite clear in this picture, that what you see that the probability that sigma x is equal to sigma y in this coupling, uh, what you see is that you have two possibilities. Either they were connected by the omega, these two things, and then, so, then they necessarily have the same spin, so x is connected to y by omega, and if they are not, right, the probability that they have the same spin is one over q, or one over two, depending if you look at q. And therefore, what you see is that p The probability that two sites have the same spin minus one over Q, because that's what you're looking at. The correlation, of course, if they were independent, then this probability would be one over Q. So you want to know what is the extra thing that you have because of the interaction between sigma at X and Y. So you have to look at this, this quantity. Um, then what you end up is just uh, something like probably one over one minus one over Q times the probability that X is connected to Y by omega or something like that. Uh, yes. Okay. So in other words, this connectivity property of the random cluster model is what governs the correlations of the easing model. Okay. So if you understand the, uh, the asymptotic behavior of these things, then you have an information about this, and this is what you're interested in the easing model. You, are, you don't care about the connectivity properties of the set of spins of plus or minus. What you want to know is if globally a system has a magnetization or not, and so if globally, you know, if you have a much more pluses than minuses, and this is the type of things that you need to take care of uh, in the easing model. And therefore, you are back into a connectivity prop property for a percolation model, which generalizes good, I mean, the ordinary percolation, except that you have to, to put this uh, special weighting. Okay, so this was just a, 
warm up, just to motivate the fact that it is interesting to look at these models. Okay? And in a way, if you prove conformal invariance of these structures, of these percolation structures, connectivity properties of, of, uh, for these models, you will end up uh, getting conformal invariance of correlation functions of the easing model. Okay, so that's, that's the first step. Now, um, maybe I should say a few words about... So that's the f first thing. And then and there are a number of miracles that make, you know, it's, uh, certain models are nice because they are combinatorially, they satisfy very nice properties and that can be surprising. And these, this random cluster model has something very, uh, there's something very nice about them. And so it's, it's written up in the notes also, is that there is a duality property of, of uh, random cluster models. And so the idea is the following. So Q larger than one is fixed. Right? What you say is omega follows, suppose that you have a, a configuration that follows the little P, Q in the graph G. Right? So you fix Q, P, and, and you r define this configuration. So it's a configuration on this graph, say, let me take this graph simply. So I draw in red those that are open and the other ones are closed, right? Okay. That's omega. What you know is that you can always define a dual configuration exactly as what you do in, uh, for percolation, usual percolation. So that means that you look at the dual graph. So for each edge, There's a unique edge, you know, so for each edge of the initial graph, you define the edge in the dual graph that joins the two neighboring faces. So the sides of the dual graph are the faces of the initial graph and the, the, the edges of the initial graph and the dual graph cross. And what you decide is that if, sort of, uh, if this is E and this is E star, you define a dual configuration as omega star such that this is 1 minus omega of E. In other words, if E is open, then E star will be closed for omega star and vice versa. One also in this cross, one of the two is open, the other one is closed. And therefore, here in this picture, what you see is that there's a dual configuration, omega star, which is given by something, which is here, right? So. Now, in ordinary percolation, it's clear that if omega is percolation with parameter p, then omega star is percolation in the dual graph with parameter 1 minus p. Right? Because things are independent, and the probability of p open is the probability that the other one was closed. Now, what happens in fk is that uh, then omega stars still is the fk configuration. So that, and the configuration changes P, right, where P star satisfies, I think it's P over 1 minus P times P star over 1 minus P star is equal to Q. So, which means that there is some, a priori you would say, well, there's no reason. You know, you choose the red one with this strange weighting by according to the number of, uh, conf uh, number of connected components. And then you take the dual one. You say, well, it will be complicated. But it turns out just because of uh, Euler's formula that you can express, you know, the number of connected components of the first one in terms of the number of open edges of the other one and the number of connected components of the other one. And so you have a little, it takes a few lines to check that actually it will be still a random cluster model uh, for the other one. 
So the special value, what is the special value? The special value is when p is equal to p star, because that's what you guess that some you know, self-duality will hold, and you may expect something uh, uh, that this special value is a critical one. And the special value, therefore, is p equals square root of q over 1 plus square root of q. Of course, when q is 1, this is 1 half. This is what you would expect, uh, because uh, I mean, when q, p, when q is 1, p star is 1 minus p. But when q is not 1, then you know the, the relation between p and p star is slightly more complicated. And so the goal now will be to work for this, with this model. So the goal is to say, now let's focus on random cluster model. Choose a q larger than 1 or choose q equal 2 if you want to do something on the easing model, and choose the parameter p to be equal to this value, and try to say something. So go. No, you will see. I mean, the, the, the it, it says certain things, but uh, it doesn't know. It, it's... Right now, it really works, you know, completely only for q equals 2. But there are plenty of things that are valid more generally, and some specific argument I will try to show you at what moment you, q equals 2 makes life much, much simpler. And actually, sort of, I believe one of the reasons Stas didn't want to give, give the paper out in the, to the, in the world, you know, send it out in the world, was precisely that we were saying, well, you know, he, he wants to do the real, you know, real thing. So he tried, you say, I mean, he said some, he was thinking, well, okay, I'm not interested in proving conforming invariance of just the easing model. I want to prove the whole thing of all the models. And, and then, okay, he had the nice proof simplification for the easing model, and the other were, were sort of technically uh, unpleasant and was not clear what was exactly coming out. So he decided, okay, let's write the give the easing model to that is an interesting piece there. Okay. So the goal now is to look at so the goal choose P I mean Q larger than one. P equals square root of Q over one plus square root of Q. So what do we want to prove? We want to prove something like uh, take a domain, finite domain D, consider a lattice approximation. D delta will be a lattice approximation of D on delta Z squared. Look at P, P, Q, and D delta, and try to understand what happens when delta goes to zero. Okay. And prove conforming variance of something. So you see here, there's a crucial role here is played by uh, by the self-duality and the fact that when you are at the critical value, basically the yellow configuration and the red configuration have the same play the same role. Now there's a little uh, something is not slightly symmetric in the picture. So imagine that I take this graph here. Right. What is the dual graph of this guy? The dual graph of, of, if this would be G or D delta or whatever, then the dual graph looks like this. Right? But it's not exactly this because, in fact, the outer, all the point, the outer face is just one point. 
right? So the, the dual graph is, in fact, something like this, where, where all these guys here end up to the, in the same, are the same here, right? So the dual graph of the square is not the dual graph of, uh, it's not really a square. And in particular, for in the case of percolation, it, we didn't care about this because the law, you know, you don't need to, do, it doesn't change the law of who's open, who's closed here, and the crossing probabilities doesn't change things. But here, if we say that all these outer guys are the same points, are the same site, that changes the way to count the number of connected components. And therefore, it changes uh, the law of the, red, the guy on the red graph and the guy on the white graph are not the same because there's a diff there are diff two different ways to count the number of connected components uh, by identifying all points to the, on the outside or not. So the natural trick here is just to say, well, we're going to divide, to make, to make it more symmetric, we're going to divide the, the, the boundary of the white guy. So let me take the white guy slightly larger here. Into two parts. Basically, where one part, we are going to decide that all the, you know, uh, let's, let's do it that way. We're going to decide that all these edges are open. We condition it in such a way that all the edges on one half of the boundary of the white rectangle are open. So in other words, what we are doing is the same as just, you know, deciding that all these points here are just one single point. Right? Because that means when they're open, that means that everything that touches these are connected and form one simple connected component. Right? And deciding that these ones are open, and on the other side we don't decide anything, well, what happens to the red thing? So of course this one cannot cross here, so it's blocked. So it's as if these edges would not be there in the red graph. And on the other side it would be just the same as if now, these guys are all open on the dual graph because all these guys here now are the same point. Right. So if you look, at, you look at the random cluster configuration in this graph G, when one half of the boundary is conditioned to be open, the dual configuration would be basically a configuration in the dual, I mean, in the red graph, where this time all these guys are conditioned to be open for the dual configuration, right? And so this is much more symmetric, and which is one reason why it is natural to now not look at uh, the domain, just a domain D like this, but we're going to take a domain D and two boundary points, A and B. And these two boundary points will play the role of where basically we, does this change of boundary condition, if you want, take place? So you take a domain D, take two boundary points A and B, take a lattice approximation of, of, of this domain in delta Z squared. Right? Find here an approximation of B, an approximation of A, and condition the FK measure now to be such that the boundary here is open. And then the, in, for the dual configuration, what you will see is that for the dual configuration, it will be an FK measure where basically something is conditioned to be open here in the dual configuration. Okay. So if you want to think about in terms of what does this uh, conditioning do about the easing configuration, so the corresponding easing configuration to the, for this uh, thing, where, which is wired at one part, would roughly say that you condition, say, all the points you know, that are sitting here on the boundary uh, to be plus, because they all need to have the same spin. So you might as well decide that this spin is plus. And here, on the other side, you don't condition on anything. So it's like a little bit like taking conditioning easing on being plus on some specified part of the boundary, which is something actually natural to do. OK, I'm really much slower than.
So there's a first trick that shows, uh, that makes life uh, much simpler and that, uh, so let me keep, um, it's, it's a nice trick and actually this type of pictures you can see in you know, all the papers in Coulongas or whatever by Ninhois or these people. So remember, so basically the, the configuration, the choice of a configuration omega is in a way you are going to divide uh, this picture into small pieces and basically here around each thing here you, have, you can just draw a little square like this right? and in each square basically either you choose uh, the white one or you choose the red one right? so that's is if, if, if the square is initially in the initial picture is like this and you have the other squares which are and you choose one of these two and in the other picture if it's a square that uh, has this parity of course there are one out of two it's, it's like a checkerboard uh, configuration so this one will you would choose you have to choose this or this okay. so basically you can decompose the FK uh, configuration by saying, well, instead of saying each edge is open or closed, you just look at it as a little picture and it looks more symmetric to, uh, to, to see it this way. Either it's the edge here is open, this means it's omega is open and it's this picture, and if uh, it's closed, it's that picture. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to decorate this picture. You're going to decorate and you're going to decide that if it's like this, you do it two semicircles like this. Okay. You decorate this picture like this. So basically what you are going to what you are drawing is that for for each half, you know, middle of a boundary segment here, there is an orange path that goes inside the square and exits somewhere else, and this orange part is constrained to hit, is allowed to hit neither the white edges nor the red ones. You see that the orange part here, it it's precisely avoids the white and the red ones, both, in the, in the configuration. So let's see what you get here in the picture that you have here. So maybe, I will already uh, decide that we have chosen the, uh, the configuration with these uh, boundary conditions here. Right? Okay. Just to make it uh, in, uh, in our setting. So now it's, I'm in a bad shape because I have to <laughs> make sure. So basically what is going to happen here is that you have a picture like this. So let me first do it in, in the inside here. Here you have this. Um, it's terrible. Because um, I, I need to be... Um, Okay, if you draw the picture correctly, I, I'm just, let me do it. Uh, uh, you see a picture like this. Okay, this is a very bad example because, okay. So you, you will, you end up with a picture like this. And it's a bad picture because obviously something went wrong in my, in my picture like this. But what you see here, forget about the precise picture, what you see is that if you now look, say, at the square like this, and now you look at the middles of all these squares that you have here, 
there will be an, exactly one orange path going in both directions starting from this, each of these orange points that will make turns like this. And they are not allowed to cross the, the white thing, the, the, the yellow thing, and they're not allowed to cross the uh, red thing. So you have two possibilities if you look at the picture. Either the orange part you look at you know, continues like this and goes out of the picture here or here, or it makes a loop. So what you see here is that, roughly speaking, by just coloring the picture in that way with these orange little orange things, you see that there's a bijection between uh, the configuration is omega, and the bijection with uh, configurations of turning loops. So when I say turning loops, means that they are, they always have to turn at each each time they meet a square, they have to turn right or left. That's because what you have. They have to go through every point, so uh, dense. Uh, and that's it, right? So basically, in each configuration, so if, if I would uh, do the flip is this by, you, you have something with, you have loops like this plus one extra path that goes out. Okay. Now, why is this definition nice? And why is it so that this loop representation is, is nice is the following, is that if you look at the probability to see a configuration omega, right, we said it's, uh, say, p number of open edges for omega, 1 minus p closed edges for omega, divided by z, q to the power number of connected components of omega. Okay. Now, if you take you know that this is also equal to p of omega star, because omega star and g star follows also an FK prob I mean percolation probability with uh, parameter p, because we are at the dual value where p is equal to p star. So you know that this is equal to p to the number open of omega star, 1 minus p close for omega star, q to the k of omega star divided by z. Okay? So in particular, you know that this is equal to the square root, say, of p of g of omega, p of g star of omega star, because they are the same. And if you look at what happens now, so this will be a z star here. This is a constant, 1 over z z star. Square root of, now, you have p to the power number of open edges of omega plus number of open edges per omega star. So of course, given the fact that an edge is either open for omega, and if it's not open for omega, then its dual one will be open for omega star. So this, num this sum here is just a constant, is the number of edges. Here you have 1 minus p to the power closed edges of omega plus closed edge of omega star. And again, for the same reason, it's just the number of edges of g star, which is the same as the number of edges of g. And now you have just q to the power k of omega plus k of omega star. Right? So this quantity is a constant times square root of q to the power the sum of the number of connected components of omega plus the number of connected components of omega star. Okay. So here you see that this p value has disappeared again. We are back. And so this is something where we don't interpret, I mean, the, the loop configuration doesn't come into the game here at all yet, right? It's just a thing about fk things. Except that if you look at the loop configurations, what you, re what you will recognize is the following, is that if I have a cluster, say a white cluster, right? 
because of the definition of the loop configuration, actually there will be exactly a loop that goes around, that sort of goes exactly around the cluster. So for each orange loop, so for each cluster, there exists a white cluster, there will be exactly, you can associate naturally one loop, which is the one that just, you know, wraps around this cluster. And it's the same for each uh, red cluster. For each cluster of omega star, there will be also exactly one loop going around the cluster. So here, of course, in the picture, the example was bad because the only loop that you see here is the one that goes around this cluster consisting only on, on this one point. Okay? So basically, for each loop, uh, for each cluster, you can associate a loop. And conversely, for each time you see an orange loop, you can associate a cluster by just looking at what is exactly in, in the inside of the loop. Because it does this, that it means that here you have open edges or closed edges. So you have a bijection between the set of clusters and the number of loops in your and, and, and the loops in your configurations. Of course, there's a special role played by, uh, you know, the, the orange loop here, because here there's a there's a, the cluster attached to the wired, I mean, to the boundary here that we have decided to be wired, and the orange thing doesn't go around. So this one has a choice to either go like this or to go like this. Right. So it's easy to see that k of omega, so k of omega plus k of omega star minus 2, if you subtract these two clusters attached to the boundary uh, here, is equal to the number of loops in the loop configuration. And so this is just equal to a constant times square root of q to the power number of loops. Okay. So this is a little bijection that tells you basically that uh, for in the nice case, you know, when you are self-dual, when you are, uh, and so on, there's another, yet another way to interpret uh, the FK configuration, which is having to do with families of loops, you know, that have to wind, always turn. At each step, they turn right or left with 90 degrees. And, and the weighting now is really simple. And you see here that there's square root of q showing up. So, you know, fk, I mean, uh, square root of 2 to the power number of loops. Uh, in the case of easing, you know, it's not something, uh, this doesn't have a sort of trivial interpretation in terms of easing the square root of 2. That should be okay. okay. Um, now, let me write the theorem. So the theorem is the following, is that, so suppose we are here with D, delta, you have A here, B. And we have to, we want to find what is the event that is going to replace uh, the crossing probability. So what is going to converge when delta, what is one able to prove is going to converge when delta goes to zero. And here, you know, here comes uh, um, the type of moment when we see, well, now this was, you know, maybe physicists said all sorts of things that we didn't understand, and now we start seeing that what it could mean. So, you know, there are different things that show up in the physics literature. First of all, they like to take complex probability measures. So it's a probability measure, but it's not a probability measure because the probability of some configuration is a complex number. So for us, it doesn't mean anything doesn't have any interpretation of. So that's one thing that shows up in these, uh, in, in their tricks. The other thing is the conformal field theory. Uh, so that roughly says that the scaling limit, you know, of, of uh, correlation functions and this type of things are conformally invariant. And for them, conformally invariant means really the fact that when you apply a conformal transformation, the, the you know, uh, the the probability or, or the function here, f of this different of observable, is going to be transformed by f prime of z given, uh, or phi prime of z 
to some power alpha times uh, f. Things like that in the, in the domain phi of d. Things like that, where the phi prime is not the absolute value of phi prime, it's the actual real complex number, which is the derivative. You know, so, so the functions f here, obviously, have to be complex valued, because you, you, you need really to have phi primes that show up, and not, not uh, just the uh, norms. Right? So in, in some, somehow, you, are, you, are, you have to play with things that are not real numbers, not probabilities, but something that where you use the complex numbers also in the definition of what you observe. And in fact, if you look at what happens in the, in the percolation picture, the way Cardi proved, for instance, Cardi's form, I mean, derived Cardi's formula, what you see is, is that he proves some, I mean, that, that in some sense, the percolation case is a very degenerate case. In the sense that he first proves something for Q, okay, I haven't said here that Q, uh, percolation, of course, is Q equal one here. Roughly speaking, he proves something for the other models when Q is different than one with complex numbers and so on. And then he takes some limit when Q goes to one and something happens. So that in some sense, the percolation case is a very degenerate case. Uh, and in some sense, for the conformal field theory perspective, could be actually more complicated than the others because you have first to derive things when Q is larger than one and then pass to a limit. So there is a... a in a way, if one understands what happens with these complex things there, we, one starts to really understand better what conformal field theory is about and what you are actually, what the physicists were actually say. And of course, you know, it's, it's like uh, uh, when they say, well, we tell complex probabilities or some things like that, we say, well, I mean, you, you go home, you say, maybe it means something, and you say, no, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't have a probabilistic interpretation. What can you do about it? And so on. So you forget about this. They are crazy people. So, and then when the proof shows up, said, ah, maybe yes. Now you know that something was deeply inside here. So, so the picture is the following. What you are going to 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 look at is not the probability of a given event. So you see, remember we started discussing SLE the, uh, yesterday. Right? So. SLE, of course, here in this picture is a very natural object also because here you see you have the loops and you have one special path, which is this guy. And at the end of the day, the goal is to prove that this path is an SLE because it has to satisfy all the properties that you would expect from an SLE and it has conformal invariance in it and the conformal invariance will come from the fact that you prove conformal invariance of something here in these loop configurations. So note here that if you just will not come back to that here, but if you condition, say, on the fact that the, the orange thing starts like this, then you are left in the loop configuration models, but with a new, new domain, where the new domain is basically this thing where, you, where this is now the new part of the boundary. And, and this is the new part of the boundary here because you have discovered you know, that the, on your left side you are uh, yellow and your right side you are white and therefore you are left with the configurations in new model. Okay, so you want the natural thing, one natural thing to do would be say for, if, for a given point Z here, you know, uh, what is the probability that this special orange curve goes through Z? Note that Z is, is, is important. In, I mean, the orange curve is, is uh, important uh, because of the following reason. Uh, uh, or maybe I should not uh, bother you with that. But. So, so the idea is the following. For each Z here in the domain, we can define sort of some Z delta which is an approximation on the grid of size of uh, mesh size delta in my domain d delta. And now what you're going to do is define f delta of z the expected value of indicator function of z belongs to gamma. And gamma here is this orange special curve. Maybe gamma delta. 
right? It's the probability that the path goes exactly through this point z delta, that the orange path goes precisely there. That would be just a probability, something that looks like you know, a probability of a certain event. But you are doing something different, which is you are going to weight this configuration, this probability, by a complex weight, a complex number that depends on the configuration omega. So let me now describe to you how, do you, how you do, uh, you, you describe this. So the picture is basically here you have A, here you have B, here you have your domain D delta, and you have your orange curve, right, gamma, that is doing, always turning, it's a self-avoiding curve that and that goes out from B here. Now you define W from uh, Z to B by uh, gamma. So if this is gamma. It's basically, you keep track of the number of, so Z is somewhere here. You look at how many times you turn right minus the number of times you turn left here when you go from when you go from, from uh, Z to B, right? So you can follow the argument you know, of the derivative of gamma along the path, right? And this will, at each time you turn right, it moves up by pi over two. Each time you turn left, it turns down by pi over two. And you just count how many times you turn right minus, I mean, how, the angle that you turn by going from Z to B. So you look at the variation of the angle here from here to there. And you're going to weight this by e to the i times some number sigma, so s sigma ch number chosen later. Depending on, that will depend on q, when easing sigma will be one half. e sigma times w uh, z to b times uh, uh, by gamma. So depending on the configurations, this probability that when you go through Z delta, sometimes you will count plus one, some t if there's no turn, maybe then it will be some complex number, and you have already the feeling that probably a typical configuration in the long run will be a configuration where the path turns in both directions many times around Z, so there will be some averaging out in this, in this sum. Okay. So the theorem, uh, so as I said, you believe that there is some averaging out and that probably this number, uh, this probability will not, uh, I mean, will, this quantity will go to zero, right? Because first of all, the pro the, it's very unlikely that the curve goes through a given point. Uh, uh, this probability might go to zero, and then there's this averaging out over these complex, you know, uh, fermionic weights, and you'll see in a moment where, why it's called a fermionic weight, um, that also makes these things to be even smaller. Uh, so you have to multiply by delta to something. And so the result, unless I'm mistaken, is delta to the minus one half times F delta of Z converges as delta go to zero uh, uniformly in any compact subset of uh, D to a function uh, phi to be uh, described later. I don't want to define you what this function is. The only important thing is that this function is defined just when you know d, a, and b, 
i of z, and that it is conformally invariant. That means that when you map, and you will see in a moment in what sense it is conformally invariant. Yes? Yes, yes, you will see it's a very, very nice. Uh, So maybe I should, uh, I, I'm just wondering whether I have the right constant. Uh, let me see. Maybe I'll write down the. Maybe, OK, I'll, I define this to be psi, in order not, if you look at Smirnoff's paper that you don't have. that you don't have the right notations. And OK, let me describe what, what this number is. So this, no, uh, this far psi is. So basically, you have d, a, and b. So now we have two boundary points, right? So what is the most natural domain you want to map d onto? What is the nat most natural domain simply connected where the two boundary points are playing a natural symmetric nice roll, and, and all the other points are the same. Well, you want to map this by a map phi onto the infinite horizontal strip, right? In such a way that basically b is here at infinity and a is here at infinity. That's the most natural domain. Okay. Now. Of course, this conformal map is only defined up to uh, shifts, of course, because you only fix two given boundary points. There's still a one parameter choice uh, that, you have, that you have to fix. And this corresponds to the fact that you can always do the horizontal shifts in, the, in, the, in this st uh, strip will be still conformal maps from the strip onto itself that preserve these two boundary points. So in particular, even though phi is not uniquely defined, it's just defined up to uh, horizontal, cro horizontal uh, translations, phi prime is well defined. Right? Phi is defined up to additive constant. So when you derive phi, you still have an analytic function. And this one is uniquely determined uh, from the, uh, is uniquely determined. Well, uh, of course, then you say psi prime, psi is Phi prime to the one half. Well, when you take the square root, of course, in a complex way, in such a way, in a compatible way. And uh, what I haven't told you is what the width of the strip is. I think he needs to take a strip of width two. So you need to do the strip of, of size 2. So it's a simple formula. I mean, it can ex be expressed in terms of analytic uh, of special cases. Special domains can have a special formula. Now, you see that psi prime is not exactly conformally invariant. But that's something you would expect because this quantity here, you know, because of this complex weight and this weighting by these uh, 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 number of turns, you know, this might be slightly changed. So you, it, it, will, it should be, you know, something that when you rotate the entire picture or you, you do certain things, then this should uh, change slightly also. So it's not, you see, it's not a... It's exactly the type of thing where when you take the image under a conformal map, then you, you get a phi prime to some power out of it. You see here in the theorem, here in front, you have the delta to the power minus 1 half that you are renormalizing y. Right? And so it's natural that you get the same power actually here in terms of uh, depending on, on phi prime. OK, uh, we'll come back to that later. Uh, do we have to make a break uh, to change the batteries or no? Okay. 
Okay, let's let's continue. Unless you are, unless you are. Uh, Okay, so I stated the theorem for easing, and I haven't said anything about uh, the other models. Uh, the result for the other models is that here you have to put a sigma. I mean, the conjecture is, right, let me write here, conjecture where sigma for q is smaller than 4, and sigma is a function of q. Who I chose. So this theorem, you know, can be adapted to the other FK cluster representation and other POTS models, if you want. That's what one believes, in a direct way. So each, basically what happens is for each value of Q, for each number of colors or something, you have a natural way, you know, to count how many, how much the, the turnings, the turns uh, come into play or not. Now, in the case of easing, something special happens. Sigma turns out to be one half, so let me immediately show you what happens. Remember the curve, so let me look at this edge here. So I, I'm, now I'm drawing the picture. I'm shifting everything by 95 degrees, uh, by 45 degrees, sorry. And so what is happening is basically the following, that the gamma starts here at A. And it has to turn, always make uh, 90 degree turns all, all the time. So say it goes here, and it goes like this. And here it turns like this, here it turns like this. Right? Each time it turns. So there's a first remark that you can make, which is that if you color this picture, in, I mean, if you do a checkerboard, picture here of, of these squares here. The curve will always have the, these squares to its right and the, and the empty ones to its left. There's, some, there's an even odd story that says that because you have to turn each time, necessarily you always have the white ones to your right and the left ones to your left. Because you have to always go to diagonal, so that means like if you are in a you have a white bishop, you are, have to always be a white bishop for the rest of your life on the, on the, in chess. So it's, it's the same uh, story here. So, so this says the following, that if I'm looking at a given edge, right, well, I know, say, this one is black, this one is white, so a given edge can only be traversed in one direction. There's no choice. This one, if it is traversed, it is traversed in this direction and no other. It cannot go the other way around because it would have the wrong, uh, the, the wrong orientation. So each given edge here will have to be traversed in a prescribed uh, direction. And so if you draw the picture, say, in the, in the square lattice, what you see is that You get something like, I write the possible directions and so on. Okay? So that's the first remark. So because of that, what you see
is that when I go through, a, if I have a given edge z, so if the curve goes through z, I know in which direction I'm going. And somewhere, the curve gamma has to exit here through b, through b somewhere here. So imagine that this one is, okay, let's simplify. Imagine that this one is pointing in the same direction than the way it should exit through B. The winding number W of the path tells you basically how much, t I mean, what's the winding of the curve gamma between the moment it stopped here and between here and there. Right? So necessarily, this is a multiple of 2 pi. So necessarily here, the winding on here will be just in 2 pi z. Right? You, you might you know, wind many times around, but then at the end you get away. But then you have counted an integer number of times times 2 pi. Imagine that I'm looking at the edge here that goes where it's oriented north. Then this time, it's also easy to see that necessarily the winding here, you will have first to turn, I mean, you have to, this will be in pi over 2 plus 2 pi z, and so on. So what you see here is that the weighting that you have here will always be e to the i sigma times uh, something which is some number that depends only on the, on the edge that you're looking at, this orientation. So basically what you have is that, uh, say here, you want to say that this is, has e to the i. So let's put it this way. Let, let, let us wo work with, the, with, the, with sigma equal one half already, because that makes life simpler. Suppose sigma is one half. That means that we're going to work with the easy model eventually. Um, then basically what you see is that what you're interested in is e to the i times over two times the winding of the curve between z and b when it goes through z. So basically, this is then going to be e to the i over 2 times there will be some angle, which depends only on z, which is, you know, this uh, 0 pi over 2 pi or 3 pi over 2, so something like k of z uh, pi over 2, plus something like uh, okay, n times 2 pi. So what you see that you have two possibilities because this guy is fixed is depending only on z. Right? This can take the value basically, roughly speaking, either one e to the i pi over four plus or minus i plus or minus i and uh, plus or minus uh, e to the three i pi over four. Right? depending on this orientation of, of z, this contribution, because k is, between, is either 0, 1, or two, 2, or 3. Now this guy, now you have e to the i n pi. So this is basically minus 1 to the n times e to the i k pi over 2. Okay. So basically, in the case of easing, this strange weighting by a complex number is in fact simple. It's just you look at the probability to go through z and then to make an even number of full turns before going out of b minus the probability to go through z and make an odd number of full turns and go out. Okay? Because the complex number that is in front basically is always fixed it's either I, e to the i pi over 4, depending on which edge you're looking at. Right? So here, what we see is that, in that case, f of z 
is basically equal to the probability that, okay, to e to the i chi of k of z over pi over 4, where k, k is equal to 0, 1, 2, or 3, depending on the orientation of, of this guy, times the probability to gamma goes through e uh, through z and n even minus probability that gamma goes through with n odd. So it looks pretty much like a probability, except that now it's a, just a plus minus one. And there's this little strange thing that depending on which edge you're looking at, you have in front some uh, complex number. Now maybe, uh, it's a good time to, okay, let me now describe to you the analog, okay, you remember in the, in the conforming variance of, of easing, uh, of percolation, the basic seed was this uh, color flipping thing with these three arms with three different colors with three boundary points and uh, and uh, and if you look closely at it you've seen that actually this discrete observation can be interpreted already in the discrete case in terms of some discrete harmonic I mean discrete uh, Cauchy Riemann equation with pi over three uh, two pi over three angles so so that this discrete combinatorial thing had a meaning in terms of a discrete Cauchy-Riemann equation, and it should not be so surprising that you get conforming variance in the end. So let me now see, let us look at the discrete identity. And in fact, in a way, here it is even simpler than, than in the in the percolation case, because in the percolation case, you have the three things. You have three Cauchy Riemann, I mean, you have to look at three different things, three points. So it was not a usual Cauchy Riemann type equation, but here, uh, a relation, but here it, it, will, it will work. So let me look at, so let's say this is a point Z in this lattice. So this is the lattice where, you know, these are the edges. Where, where the, the curve omega lives, right? So the curve omega is doing things like that. It's living like this, uh, the curve gamma. Okay. So the discrete relation, is, a discrete identity is basically the following. So for each of the four neighbors here of Z, I call this one N, East, South, and West. So I take a, a a, a site Z in this strange lattice which is between the two dual lattices, right? So on this special lattice where on which the, the curve gamma lives, I choose a site and I define the four neighboring edges here to be north, south, east, or west. So remember, this is exactly the type of picture where we know that basically, so for instance, suppose that Z is like this so that you can arrive here, you can arrive here, and you have to leave through here. It can be the other way around, of course, depending on, on uh, Z is even or odd. And what we have seen is that the, the function F, right, is defined on edges. You can define F of N, F of East, F of South, F of North, right? So f of east is well defined, f of north is well defined, and so on. And what we have seen is that this one basically, uh, suppose that b is pointing east, that basically f of east, uh, okay, f of west, right, in this picture, and you imagine that you have to go out through b here like this. Right? What we know is that f of uh, west, so this guy, because of our previous uh, statement, is a real number, right? Because it's a probability that 
the, the number of terms will be a multiple of two pi, so it will be counted either with plus one or minus one. So the f of here, so f of west here is a real number. Okay. Now, uh, this guy is imaginary because you have to have a half turn more, right? So this one is parallel to i. And then you get that this guy will be parallel to e to the uh, i or minus i pi over 4, and this will be parallel to uh, e to the uh, i pi over 4. Uh, I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, sorry, this one is parallel to i. That's what you end up. Because here, you have to first turn right. So it's a e to the right means a negative here, because we're counting in trigonometric thing. So you have to e to the minus i pi over 4, and then you are back into the horizontal, pointing to the right direction again, and so on. Now, so the, the discrete observation is a proposition. It's just that f of north plus f of south is equal to f of east plus S f of west. And here, this is very nice. And so this is very special. I mean, this is actually true for any FK model. If you choose sigma appropriately, we'll see that in a moment. But of course, this is particularly nice in the case of the easing model. Because in the case of the easing model, Right? Remember, this one, these two are orthogonal. And these two are orthogonal. Right? Because this one is, say, this one is real. This is imaginary part. And this one is on, on the e to the i pi over 4. And this is e to the minus i pi over 4. So you have an orthogonal de decomposition of, of some complex number according to, to some basis. And this makes life really, really very nice. And you'll see a bit later why. So in particular, what you are then want to say is that you want to define this quantity, this complex number that shows up as, as being the sum of these two or the sum of these two. You want to say that this is f at the vertex that allows you to define the function. Yeah? For q? Uh, yeah, Q. No, this is true also for other values of Q. And you'll see, in, it's, it's very nice because you see the relation between Q and sigma. And it's, that's basically the first moment when you see explicitly that Q equals 4 is a dead end. You cannot, this is only true for, for Q when, it will work only when Q is small or equal to 4. You, you'll see. Uh, yes, but for one, you will see things uh, degenerate completely. Well, okay. Well. So, how do you prove such a thing? Yeah, so I, I will show you a little bit later that basically this relation implies basically almost for free, in the case of easing, the fact that if you define f on uh, vertices like this, that f satisfies discrete Cauchy Riemann equation. Maybe I should leave this as, a, as an exercise. Is basically, if I take z1, z2, z3, z4 here, right? And I have my four edges. So you see what you, if you look at this, config, at this picture in the case of easing. So I'm, I'm just showing you that in the case of easing, this tells you some discrete analytic city property. So remember, these are orthogonal decompositions of this number f of z. So this says that f of z say f of z1 here, 
is uniquely determined once you know f on this edge and that edge. Of course, these two are not orthogonal, but we know that f on this edge is the orthogonal projection of f of z1 on this direction, on the direction given by this edge. And f, and what you see on this edge is the orthogonal uh, projection of the value of f of z on this edge, on the direction given by this edge. So it's like you have a complex number, you know its real value, and you know its projection on e to the i pi over 4, then you know the complex number. Right. So that says that when I know the value here and I know the value here, I know actually the value of the function here, and therefore I know the, function, the value of the function all over the place, or the other two. Okay. Now, the claim is, what if, if you look at f of z3 minus f of z1, that means you take the difference between this one and this one. Right? Because of what I just said, you can express f of z3 in terms of a linear combination of this one and this one. You can express f of z1 as a linear combination of this one and this one. And it's a simple linear combination. Now, if you can, you can do the same, picture, same thing with f of z, say, of 2 minus f of z4. And it will be also a linear combination of these four guys. And you see that there is some symmetry, you know, some rotational symmetry. Each time you turn by pi, by pi over 2, you, you, you have this i to the pi over 4 that comes into the game. Right? So, if you use this relation and this linear combination, immediately what you get is that basically this quantity here, which is the difference in this direction, is just the difference in this direction times i. So you just have to fill in two lines. You just say, express this difference in terms of a linear combination of what you see on these four edges. Express this in the same way. You see it's the same linear combination, except that you have rotated by i, and therefore that's what you get. Now, this is exactly a Cauchy-Riemann equation. It means the discrete derivative gradient in this direction is the same as the discrete gradient in this direction rotated by i, by pi over 2. So this is exactly a discrete Cauchy-Riemann equation. And it's, in fact, we are better off than in the percolation case, in a way, because this is an exact, it, it, this is a true Cauchy very discrete analyticity statement. It's not an approximate one like in the, in the percolation problem, we have this problem that you know you are, you are looking, uh, when you turn like this, then you are shifted to the right, you turn like this, you are shifted to the left, so it's, you have, it's a slightly blurred or approximate analyticity proper, property. Here, you have an exact analytic, discrete analyticity property. So in particular, you see that the many, so f, you know, will be, you, you will have some integral formulas or things like that about, of, about f. So many things that are true for analytic uh, function in the continuous are true in the discrete guy also and discrete for discrete analyticity also. So, so of course, here you know, you realize that this, what I just said, this little argument that says that this implies discrete analyticity here, this only works in case of easing because you have this orthogonal decomposition and things are nicer here. There, I mean, otherwise, you, something, is, something is slightly missing. Okay, let's, let's see how to prove this proposition. And you will see it will be reminiscent of, uh, really reminiscent of the percolation picture because in a way, the way to prove this identity will be, again, to have a combinatorial trick to have some bijection between some set of uh, some configuration and some other configuration and to put them together. A little bit like in, the, like in the percolation picture where you had these three arms events and you rotate them and then if you, you might, you know, uh, consider simultaneously the, uh, I mean, there's some involution that tells you that the probability of one guy is the same, or one event is the same as the probability of the other one, and to, to count these things together. So how do we do this? So let, let me take an example, but I'm not restricting anything. So suppose that Z 
is the guy that where, where basically west, where the orientation is like this. Of course, it doesn't change anything. And, uh, and suppose that B is looking like that way. I'm not restricting myself to anything. Now, suppose that we have a configuration gamma, where gamma goes through Z and arrives like this. So Z is a, here's an edge, is a, is a side. Suppose that gamma is basically doing this, turns left, and goes away. Okay, That's the configuration omega. Omega is a configuration where gamma comes through here, goes turn right, and then goes away and uh, does something. It doesn't come back a second time. So that means that here, in this picture, there's a loop. right? Because that, that means that this is not in gamma. So that means that this is necessarily a loop. So here you have a, so you have a loop here. That's the configuration omega. Now, to each configuration omega like this, I will associate a, a configuration omega prime. And omega prime is just obtained by changing the configuration here, just at z. So here, in omega prime will be just changing the state of this edge here, corresponding to the fact that one edge that was closed is going to be open, basically. So now for omega prime, the configuration is basically that the curve comes here, goes, so if that is here, it turns left, does something, comes back here, turns right again, and then it continues like omega does. Okay. Now it's clear that to each configuration omega, such that the curve goes through z, I can associate uniquely a configuration omega prime such that the curve still goes to z by just changing lo local configuration at z. Right? So the map from omega to omega prime or from omega prime to omega is a bijection. Now, what we have here is that we're looking, remember, this is the expected value of a certain quantity plus the expected value of a certain quantity is exact expected value here, expected value here. So we are just going to regroup the contribution to this, to this expectation here, the contribution of omega and the contribution of omega prime. Right? So we fix a given configuration omega. So we look at the contribution to this. for this configuration omega, and we are going to add the contribution of omega prime. Now, there's a one first remark that you want to do is that, of course, here, so remember omega was like this. The probability of omega is just equal to square root of q times the pro configuration probability of omega prime. Because if you count the number of loops, you haven't changed anything except that here you have one more loop than there. Okay. By opening you know, this, uh, this thing here, you have opened up one loop and you have one loop less. And the probability of a configuration is, square, is proportional to square root of q times the number of loops, uh, to the power number of loops. So you have this. Now let us just look at the contribution in that precise example of, uh, of uh, omega you know, to this number of turns. So suppose that defines say y to be e to the i times uh, i sigma, uh, this winding number uh, between uh, z, uh, uh, west and b by uh, gamma. So basically, what I'm saying is that uh, what I call y is the e to the i times number of total turns uh, done by, by this path from here all, all over the way to b. 
So here in that picture, W is a multiple of 2 pi. Uh, and uh, and if, if I would have chosen B in another direction, then it would be 2 pi multiple of 2 pi plus some constant time pi over 2. Right? And let us define Let us define lambda equals e to the i sigma pi over 2. That's basically, each time you make a quarter, uh, a quarter turn, you multiply by lambda or divide by lambda, depending if you turn right or left. Okay. So let's look at this picture. So let me write w north, east, and south here for omega. Let me do a little thing like this and see we're going here in this picture, I'm going to write e to the i sigma w uh, between the edge and b by uh, gamma. Right? Remember, I'm doing the expected value of a certain random variable. I'm just counting for each configuration what this random variable is. Okay. So here, I have already defined the fact that in, for omega, this is what I called y. Right. That's the number, this exponential to the i sigma times number of turns that you do. That's the way you define it. Now north, in that configuration, gamma does not go through north. So forget about it. This doesn't count, or you can say zero. It doesn't go through east, and it goes through south, but it has turned once to the right. You know? So it has to turn once to the left more than when it came through w. So here you have uh, lambda times y, okay? Because you have to turn once more, or, or say between w, you, at the moment at which you were at W, at the moment where you were at S, you turned once to the right, so you divided by lambda, and, and, and so you, you have to compensate later on. Okay? Now, for omega prime, you see what I'm doing here is, uh, is true actually for any, I mean, I, I don't use easing here. I made on purpose back a sigma and a q here. Now, for omega prime, you always have y here, because Anyway, when, when you do all these things here, when you come back here, you, you have made a full turn here when you went around this loop. So you didn't add any, you didn't add any you know, uh, winding around here by adding the loop. So here, in this configuration here, the winding here when you arrive here is always still the same. It's still given by the same as here. Right? By opening the loop here, you turn as many times left than the, you turn right when you come before, until you come back. So here, what you get here is, is still y, the configuration. Now, here's the difference. And here, of course, here, this is still lambda y. That's also true, because when you end up here, then the end of the path is still the same as what you started, as, as here and there. So the winding number, the contribution to the winding number here and the winding number here is the same. Now, of course, here, I have turned once to the left. So the picture is exactly the opposite one as here. So here, the north one is y over lambda. Right? Because I have turned once to the left uh, between w and north. And then, when I, because I want to come back through here, I have to make three, time, three more uh, east turns than west turns. So what you end up here uh, is something like lambda squared y. And indeed, when you, when you turn once to the left, again, you are back into lambda y, which is what you do when you come from here to there. Now, so this is just, of course, it's much simpler to do it yourself than to listen to me saying that you multiply by lambda. You know, it's the type of thing it's easier to do yourself, but it's, it's simple. Now, what you do is you want to sum the contribution of omega and omega prime for each given omega. You want to sum the contribution of these to this quantity that you have here. So that means that you have to, have to weight them by a given, uh, by their probability. So what is going to happen 
is that you have probability of omega prime times. So now let's look at what comes from omega prime. So you get y plus OK, no, sorry, there's a plus and minus here. So you, you count north and south with plus and east and west with minus. Right? So you get uh, minus here, uh, plus y over lambda, minus lambda squared y, uh, plus lambda y. Right? That's the thing with omega prime. And now you count the configurations coming from this and that. So then this time you have uh, minus square root of q because you have this weighting, which is probability of omega is square root of q times probability of omega prime. So you have minus square root of q times y. Uh, and then plus square root of q times lambda y. That's the contribution, the sum of the contribution of the configuration omega and the configuration omega prime to this quantity. So this quantity, in a way, will be the sum of all configurations omega, or one half of the sum of all configurations omega, because then you count them twice, of quantities like that. So of course, if now we know that this guy is 0 for any omega, then we're done. That means if the contribution of omega and the contribution of omega prime balances out exactly, then you're done. Would be very nice, of course. Well, let's look at this. Of course, you have y is in, so you can, so you have y probability of omega prime. Okay, so what we have, minus one, plus one over lambda, minus lambda squared, plus lambda minus square root of q, plus square root of q times lambda. Right. So it's quite clear that we want to put 1 minus lambda uh, or lambda minus 1 yp of omega prime. Uh, and what we get here is lambda. So this is um, minus uh, 1 over lambda plus uh, Say it, minus lambda uh, plus square root of q. Yeah. So what do you want to choose for lambda? Well, what you want, remember lambda is this. Right? So this is equal to some stuff times square root of q minus 2 cosine sigma pi over 2. Because this is just minus 2 times the cosine of the angle here. Remember, lambda is a complex number with modulus 1. So what you want to do? Well, we choose <laughs> sigma in such a way that cosine sigma pi over 2 is equal to square root of q over 2. So indeed, when you take q equals 2, you have sigma is 1 half. Because here you have square root of 2 over 2 and pi over 4 here. You're happy. So note that several interesting things here. So this says that this relation here is true for any q if you choose sigma in this way. And of course, this only works. And this is basically the most convincing argument towards the fact that q equals 4 is special. This only works when q is between 0 and 4. Because if q is larger than 4, this guy is going to get smaller than, uh, get larger than 1. There's no way to find a sigma. That's the first remark. Now, the second remark is, of course, you know, maybe you didn't like trigonometry when you were <laughs> in high school, but it's fun here because the integer values of q, right, are exactly those that give nice, ang uh, nice values for sigma. Right? 
Well, Q equals zero, okay, let's forget about Q equals zero for the moment. It has to do with uniform space. Q equal one, which is percolation, right? So one half, so you have here pi over three or showing up when, oh, pi over three had something to do with percolation indeed, yeah? Remember Smirnoff's uh, result. Now then you take Q equals two, that's nice. Q equals three is nice too, because then it's a pi over six. So, for, so basically for each integer value of the POTS model, you get something nice. And uh, for, for Q equal, uh, uh, Q equal four, then of course uh, you get sigma equals uh, to zero, or maybe, okay, depends wh which way you look at things. Okay. Uh, okay. So maybe it's a good time to stop now, but probably we will need another session to make uh, this work. So w what we've seen so far is basically that the, here we don't use this college flipping argument. What we use is just, you know, the local flip of one configuration. Right? And we sum the two contributions of the probabilities of these two configurations. And they balance out exactly. So there's a one-to-one -one map. And that creates this relation here. And as I've argued before, in the case of easing, and this is only true in the case of easing because then you have this orthogonal decomposition here, in the case of easing, this can be interpreted as a discrete Cauchy Riemann equation. And that plays the role of you know, this uh, identity with the color flipping where the der de derivative in one direction is, uh, each, I mean, uh, the de derivative of the other function in the other direction. And the nice thing about this is, first of all, that here you see that this first identity is true for any POTS models. It shows also something that what the, I mean, to which Q, what sigma is associated to which Q. Uh, it also shows that maybe, you know, uh, say if you take Q equals three, maybe the square lattice is not a good one. Maybe you should try to do something else with another lattice. But maybe if you have another lattice, you have to start again because you don't have any four, you don't have four guys incoming here, but maybe you need to do something different, but maybe uh, you have to play a little bit, but maybe it's not hopeless, you know, to get to some relation that can be interpreted in terms of discrete analyticity. Maybe for Q equals four, you can, okay. There, there are uh, chances that uh, one is able to, that, that for certain discrete models, one can say certain things. However, uh, it's clear that easing is special here because then you can directly have the direct, ana I mean, discrete analyticity without uh, worrying much longer. And then, of course, the second part of the proof, which is certainly not, you know, the trivial one or the, the is here now it's not finished, right? It's just once you have this, you need now to be very careful and go through the, use the seed of, you know, discrete complex analyticity on microscopic level in order to go all the way and prove the theorem I stated before about the convergence of the function f. Okay. And so uh, it's, things are sort of uh, more uh, delicate than, than so it's, it's not easy. Right? So it's good that Stas was the one you know, who ended up with this observation because he was also one of the people who was able to find a clever proof, you know, uh, from discrete analyticity to complex, uh, to continuous analyticity and to do it in the uh, most economic way. So there's, there's one thing I want to stress because maybe this is one aspect that I want to d discuss next time uh, when I talk about this, if there is a next time, I don't know. <laughs> uh, is that, uh, remember in the proof of uh, Cardi's formula, there were two main ingredients. There was this discrete analyticity and then you had to be careful to prove a continuous thing. But the other main ingredient was Rousseau, Seymour, Welsh, and tightness. Right, the fact that basically the, there were subsequential limits and that you can then work with the subsequential limits. So what does play the role of tightness here? We don't have Rousseau, Seymour, Welsh for easing of OFK, so you have to do something. And, uh, and uh, okay, I'll try to, to discuss that also. Okay, so, uh, so I remind you this afternoon, the Christoph is at three o'clock, right? Yes?